everybody. Uh, thank you for attending this webinar. Uh, so this is one of two webinars. Uh, the second one will be at the same time on Thursday. Um, thank you in particular to our speakers who have taken the time and the effort to participate in these webinars. Uh, these webinars are part of the NSF funded modeling collaboratory for subduction uh, research collaboration network. Um, today's webinar and uh, Thursday's webinar are part of the volcanic systems focus uh, of the modeling collaboratory. And uh, as some of you may know, we are still holding out on the possibility of an in-person workshop uh, next year related to volcanic systems. Uh, the objective of the modeling collaboratory for subduction RCN is to identify how modeling, how a modeling collaboratory can enhance subduction zone science and to make recommendations about what form such a modeling collaboratory should assume. Uh, the format of uh, today's and Thursday's webinar are two 20 minute talks followed by 10 minutes of questions. And then after that, half an hour of uh, panel discussion. Um, because this is a webinar and because of the number of attendees, uh, the attendees uh, cannot uh, ask the question uh, uh, by simply unmuting themselves. Instead, uh, what we uh, ask you to do is enter your question uh, under the question and answer uh, part of the Zoom application. So if you look at the bottom of your Zoom window, there's a Q&A. And if you click on that, a window should pop up that would allow you to either paste a question or type a question in. Uh, then uh, we will, we the moderators will try to go through as many of these questions as possible. Uh, ask the question to the speaker or the last half hour to the entire panel. And the person who answered the question will be also unmute, unmuted and can follow up uh, uh, verbally. Um, <clears throat> the last 30 minute panel discussion, uh, you know, the objective is really to talk about how volcanic system science and in particular eruption plume modeling can benefit from a modeling collaboratory. Um, and as hopefully most of you have already seen the detailed agenda that was provided, uh, this is uh, based on input from all four speakers uh, and it's meant as a starting point for discussion. It's not meant to be all inclusive or as a script. So with that being said, uh, I'll introduce the first speaker, Joe Dufek, a professor of volcanology at the University of Oregon. And he will talk about the fluid dynamics of volcanic plumes. Thanks, Elgo. That's, I'm very excited for this. And thanks to the conveners and organizers for putting this all together. I'm just going to get my presentation up here. So uh, very much in the spirit uh, of what Helga was discussing. I, I kind of view my role here is to present some perspectives on fluid dynamics of volcanic plumes. And by no means will this be a comprehensive examination. I'll focus my talk really today on what we might call mesoscale structures, structures around the volcanic column. I'll give some historical perspective and also with some open questions. So hopefully I'll be a little bit of a gadfly and get people to ask uh, more questions and discuss uh, potential things afterwards. Um, so just to get us started though, I just want to kind of lay out three sort of broad scale observations and then, then we'll move forward, forward in a talk. And the first is that, um, that you know, volcanic eruption columns are remarkably efficient at transmitting, um, at really at transmitting the um, ash in aerosols into the atmosphere, uh, both vertically and horizontally. And, uh, and these systems, even, you know, relatively moderate scale eruptions are very efficient at, at as you can see from this Mount St. Helens uh, dispersal map, they're relatively efficient at dispersing ash. 
And this ash, and I'm sorry, I have to keep sipping coffee. It's smoky here, so talking about air quality is kind of funny. But um, obviously, the volcanic ash uh, can distribute, uh, can create pulmonary hazards uh, in the far field. Once the volcanic ash gets up in the atmosphere, it's hazardous for jet aircraft engines. Aerosols generated from volcanic eruptions can also impact uh, radiative transfer and have uh, climate modification effects. So a lot of different effects, and these are very, you know, very efficient at transmitting ash throughout large volumes of the atmosphere. And to me, this uh, this is, you know, brought home by this picture here. This is a picture um, from Kizapu. So if you focus your attention on the bottom panel here, this is a picture from the the slope of Kizapu, looking out out uh, towards Argentina. And what you might first think is snow is actually tephra. Uh, and this is tephra primarily from the 1932 eruption of Kizapu. And uh, also one of the nice features you see from these set of pictures is you have this sort of draping deposit uh, from the fall deposit. Uh, and this is just a few kilometers away from source. And you can see sort of it's draping this you know, relatively steep topography. And then finally, one of the things that I'll return to towards the end of the talk is that this is a fundamentally multi-scale problem. I'll talk mostly today about fluid dynamic aspects of things going on in the, say, the um, volcanic column. But there are a lot of features going on that are happening at the scale of volcanic ash. So these are really processes going from microns to tens to hundreds to thousands of kilometers. And when we bring this back to discussing modeling, this is definitely a challenge to, to face. I should note that you know, while I'll be showing some modeling results today, I'm really not going to talk about modeling. I'll kind of use this as a way of discussing equations. Um, but I'm not going to really discuss how we solve those equations numerically, uh, nor will I discuss some of the far field um, dispersal, which I think our other speakers will discuss. So here's the anatomy of our talk. The first thing I'm going to do is just put everybody in the same framework, uh, discussing some of the anatomy of volcanic plumes, some of our cartoon pictures of volcanic plumes, and some of the nomenclature. I'll describe classic plume theory. And the reason I do this is, first of all, it's been historically important uh, for our field, uh, and also it provides us a way of discussing things that deviate from the assumptions made in these models, uh, which may be important for further predictive capability. And then, uh, then I'll talk some about some scaling analysis of volcanic jets and plumes. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about inlet conditions because ultimately that's very important uh, for this understanding the fate of where ash goes in the atmosphere. So I'll talk about uh, the choked condition and compressible effects just immediately above the vent. And then I'll, I'll venture into territory that uh, is not really captured in classic plume theory, but could be quite important for other approaches. Uh, that is particle fluid interaction, how particles are sorted in the atmosphere, uh, interaction with the dynamic in atmosphere, so windy or uh, changing atmosphere, and also details going on at the scale of volcanic ash, what I might call microphysical interaction. Uh, I'll end up talking about how these different effects go into uh, a a larger set of dynamics equations, and then list some open questions. So just to get us all oriented, this is just a, a cartoon of a, um, a model of a volcanic column. Here, this has been separated out into a jet phase and a convective phase. We use terms fairly loosely in, in our field uh, with regard to plumes. Here, I'm gonna use jet to describe um, the momentum-driven part of the, of the column. So as the, the ash and gas comes out of the volcanic vent, it's typically uh, higher density actually than the atmosphere. And so if there was no momentum, it would just kind of dribble out and cause these uh, ground hugging um, PDCs. But in certainly in many cases, we do entrain enough atmospheric air. There's a lot of thermal mass in this volcanic ash. And so it becomes buoyant relative to the atmosphere and becomes what we might term a, a buoyant plume. Uh, this will rise up in this, uh, we'll see this more and then we look at the Morton Taylor Turner results, but uh, this will rise up to a level of neutral buoyancy, overshoot a bit, uh, and then form gravity currents at the relatively at the neutral buoyancy point. This demarcation between the jet phase and convective phase, very crudely, you can estimate this sort of um, jet thrust height with a balance of potential energy and kinetic energy from the vent. So you can get a sense from this. And that balance is very much like you would do if you wanted to predict how high a, a fountain is going, you might be looking at on your campus, for example. So to give us a, a little bit of a background on, on plumes in general, I, I'm gonna turn to this paper from 1956. This is a Morton, Taylor, and Turner. And this is a, a generic plume analysis paper. It's been enormously successful. 
And, and certainly our field has benefited a lot from this work. And so I wanna kind of lay out what they found and then talk about some of their assumptions. And in this paper, if you, and I do suggest you look at it if you haven't, um, they have kind of three explicit uh, assumptions. And, and the first one is maybe the most important one. And that's the rate of entrainment at the edge of the plume is proportional to a characteristic velocity. So that is to say, they're making this a one dimensional problem. So they're, they're looking at a characteristic vertical velocity, say V here, and they're related, the, rating the amount of entrainment, in this case U, uh, based upon V and some entrainment coefficient. This coefficient takes on different values based on other studies. In, in this particular study, about 0.1 was found. This is a very good generic um, buoyant plume uh, entrainment coefficient. So about a tenth uh, of the vertical velocity goes into a horizontal entraining velocity. Uh, next assumption is that there's a self-similarity. And so while these are turbulent, uh, uh, turbulent plumes, they, and they have big scale structure and things we'll talk about later on. Um, what we're gonna assume in these calculations is that it's self-similar uh, when we average things out. And so you could have a top hat profile, which is shown in this diagram here, or you could have a, a more normal sort of shapes um, profile. But nevertheless, we assume that there's self-similarity so that we, while the, while the, the maximum amplitude might change, the shape uh, in general will not. Um, and finally, we're gonna assume, uh, as Martin Taylor Turner did, that local variations of density are relatively small relative to the background density. That changes the form of the equations we'll see in a moment. There are a set of implicit assumptions that are particularly important for our field though too. Um, and that is that this approach is really set up for a single fluid. Uh, and so this works well if your particles are well coupled to the background gas. If they start to deviate, then this is not uh, gonna be exactly right. Uh, this is going into a uniformly stably stratified background fluid. Uh, and so it's described just by a linear decay of, of uh, density with height. You can certainly complicate this and, and certainly other authors have done this as we'll see, um, but that's what this particular solution was for. Uh, we, in this particular case there's negligible momentum at the inlet. So this is a purely a plume, purely buoyancy driven. So there's not the, the sketch that we had before where we start off as a jet, momentum driven and then transition into a plume. Uh, and there's negligible entrainment after neutral buoyancy. So a lot of the details that happen at the very top of the, of the column are not uh, taken into account. And the other important thing is that this is into a quiescent background so that uh, there's, no, you know, there's no wind, for example. So these are the set of equations. So uh, Morton Taylor Turner, MTT, I'll probably refer to it as, um, start off with um, three conservation equations for volume, momentum, and density deficiency, buoyancy. And these are integrated horizontally, so they're averaged equations. So you're not worried about all the details of turbulence here. Uh, and we're basically assuming this is incompressible as well. Again, you see the entrainment coefficient popping up here in the conservation of volume equation. And just to make note that the density of the background here uh, shows row A is, is height dependent as is the density in the plume. So there are derivatives of these density quantities. Uh, and on your right, you'll see a, 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 a panel figure from uh, their paper, just showing how, how these different um, terms evolve. This is for a, um, a kind of a point source. We see the radius, of course, increasing as we go up higher in the atmosphere. Density contrast decreases and velocity decreases. And a lot like our sketch before, we see that the density contrast goes to zero in this case uh, at neutral buoyancy and the velocity continues to be above zero for a little bit beyond that, so we overshoot a slight bit. So this is kind of the background of where we've, we've thought about um, some of these problems. Um, certainly um, others have modified this approach to include, say, the inertially driven jet, and also to include energy equations, like, uh, for example, Woods 1995 included this energy uh, equation, as well as looked at, um, at non-uniform entrainment in the jet, so a slightly different entrainment coefficient. If you look at the Woods results, um, one thing it really illustrates, and so this is looking at uh, height in the column versus velocity, I'll focus your attention on this, this side of the panel here, is that the velocity that we're assuming, say 50 versus 75 versus 200, sets a lot of the dynamics, and that's mostly because of that entrainment coefficient argument. So the, this horizontal entrainment, U is equal to entrainment coefficient times velocity. So if you have a lot greater velocity to begin with, you get more entrainment, and that can determine the difference between something that collapses, 
which has happened in this 50 meters per second case versus something that rises up into the atmosphere, for example, in this case, 75 meters per second. Okay, so that gives us a background in plume theory. What I want to do is now talk about uh, departures from plume theory and talk about things that are incompletely described in that sort of approach. And I'm going to kind of step our way through these various things. I'm not going to be comprehensive at all, um, and we'll kind of lay out some questions hopefully as we go. The first that I'll talk about is really something related to compressible dynamics, basically the choked assumption going into these plumes. I'll talk about compressible effects right above that entrance. I'll talk about entrainment in general and some of the anisotrop anisotropy that we see in entrainment. And then I'll talk about particle dynamics and finally things that are going on microphysically. To get us all on the same page, so I do want to bring up these uh, scaling arguments. This is all being recorded, so you can go back to this later if you want to refer to it. I'll talk about two primary fluid scaling parameters, the Reynolds number, uh, describing uh, inertia relative to viscosity. These are all going to be right, high Reynolds number flows I'll talk about. I'll talk about the Mach number, the speed of the flow versus the speed of sound. I'll talk about two particle scaling um, parameters, the Stokes number, which is the particle time scale relative to a fluid time scale. So Stokes number zero particles would be perfect tracers. Stokes number much bigger than one will be um, ballistic particles. And then a fruit number um, that I'll use primarily to describe uh, constant forcing of gravity on the particles themselves. And I've kind of highlight, I highlighted here in red these different um, questions that I mentioned before, different parts of the dynamics that uh, these particular scaling parameters are emphasized in. So in terms of the choke flow condition, uh, this is the idea that right at the event, we can, set, we can assume that the Mach number is approximately equal to one. And the reason for this is that we, um, it's really a consequence of conservation of mass in a compressible fluid and, and conservation of momentum, let's say. Uh, this is a modified Euler equation shown here. And so the idea here, this is conservation of mass. Um, if you're familiar with the incompressible form, you'd ignore this density variation in height. Um, and then I'm just kind of illustrating this in terms of a, a case where we have, say, a conduit that's changing in width as we move up in this case. Um, so for the incompressible case, the way I have drawn these yellow arrows is what our intuition would give us, right, as we're widening or slowing down. And if we combine the conservation of mass and conservation of momentum into this, um, this relationship at the bottom, what this can be used for is telling us what the sign uh, of the change of velocity is versus change in area. And if Mach number is less than one, so that if our sound speed or our velocity is much less than the speed of sound, then, then in this case, as we increase area, we're gonna decrease velocity. It's gonna be much like we see for the incompressible fluid. However, if we go to Mach numbers bigger than one, we see that the signs are gonna be the same in this relationship. So that you get this sort of counterintuitive result that to actually increase velocity, we need to increase area. You've combined that idea, you go to this kind of white, this shown this white diagram here, a sketch of a conduit system where we're either keeping constant area or maybe slightly decreasing this area. We're really fixed to Mach numbers less than one until we can start to expand again. So this is the idea behind using the choke condition as our inlet condition. And an important part of this is that that the sound speed, if we assume that dusty particles are perfectly fixed with our fluid, is going to be set largely by the concentration. So X here is a, um, a mass fraction of volcanic ash, let's say, and it's going to decrease the sound speed. So the more volcanic ash we get, the slower sound speed we get, the smaller our speed, uh, speed limit is, let's say, coming into the atmosphere. The assumptions here, of course, are that the particles are moving exactly with the gas. And so you can examine cases where that's not true, where Stokes numbers are much bigger than one. This is just showing a conduit calculation to illustrate this. Uh, in this case, uh, you can look at volcanic pumice uh, being very clustered in this case, and also volcanic ash also being clustered. And what this gives rise to is a case where the flux coming out of the volcanic conduit is erratic in time, even though the inlet of this conduit was steady. And there are numerous other processes that can lead to heterogeneities, even in the conduit, that may give rise to different sound speeds as we exit. Uh, and just to illustrate this, this is continuing that same sort of calculation, but coupling it to a, a, a plume calculation. And we see in this case that the, the frequency that you force it in changes the entrainment 
and can set whether this collapses or not. The next effect that I'll illustrate is, uh, is compressibility effects. If you remember the Morton Taylor Turner assumed incompressible fluid. Um, if we use that, uh, that choke flow assumption, we of course get Mach equals one, but we could have various pressures. And so if we have pressures that are greater than atmospheric pressure, we'll form shocks. And if it's much bigger than an atmosphere, we'll have strong shocks. This is from a paper from Darcy Ognan in 2008. And here she's illustrating uh, with a hydrocode the effects of these, these barrel shocks. And one thing that came from this work is that there is a suggestion at least that the entrainment is gonna be modified by, this, the, by the um, strength of these shocks. Finally, another thing that's different than Morton Taylor Turney is of course our atmosphere is dynamic. Um, there are of course different structures that go on in turbulent plumes, large uh, features that have anisotropy. Uh, and also the, the, the background plume is not homogeneous uh, in, in its interior. So and we'll see an example of this in a moment. The background conditions are, can be windy, and this illustrated these two um, papers at the bottom here, among others uh, in, in literature, examining both the broad scale morphology, um, having a bent over plume, but also just changing the turbulent uh, structure of the atmosphere. And then finally is that, and this will come up, um, I, I assume uh, later in our discussion, is that there's no way we can solve the equations of motion down to the smallest scale of turbulence. It's just not computationally tractable. Another feature that really ties into this turbulent structure is particle sorting. And that is the idea that particles don't always have to follow perfect streamlines of the fluid. This is showing in a Lagrangian equation, so an equation that describes how particles are moving in the atmosphere. Uh, here I have the Stokes number and Froude number that we saw before. And the idea uh, can be illustrated by these two different papers. This is from Tang et al, where there was a, a blunt body here. And so this is showing vortex shedding. Stokes number much less than one is, are being concentrated in the core of these eddies whereas much larger Stokes number are kind of barreling through. And about Stokes number equals one, you get this sort of uh, demixing effect at the edge of the eddies. Similar features uh, happen when you turn on gravity. So these are just uh, consistent vortices that particles are dropping through and being sheared across. And you can see again, when you have Stokes number about approximately equal to one, you get a lot of these um, kind of demixing effects. These can be seen in volcanic plume simulations. Here we have Stokes number approximately one being concentrated at the edge of eddies. Uh, you can also see Stokes number less than one uh, effects in experiments, uh, like you see on the left from UBC, uh, uh, and also numerical uh, calculations as you see on the right. Uh, in this case, the Stokes number is much less than one and, and the particles are being primarily sorted into the core of eddies, um, but you also see some unfurling at the edge of the experiments in, in uh, um, work that Yoshi has illustrated here with these um, these sediment waves. Another really interesting effect that really hasn't been explored much at all in the volcanic context is the idea that this is also a two-way coupled problem and that the particles can also influence turbulence itself. So if it's very dilute, it doesn't matter so much. That's what's being shown here on this diagram. This is showing Stokes number versus concentration. So dilute effects do not affect the background turbulence much, but once you get to moderate scale concentrations, uh, large Stokes number particles can enhance turbulent production, so change the, the cascade of energy in the turbulence, whereas small scale particles can dissipate, so basically sap any energy away from the small scale eddies. And so this could potentially have an effect on some parts of volcanic plumes. And of course, particle is going to go through all parts of this up to a deposit in, in a fault deposit. And finally, microphysical effects, effects happening at the, at the scale of ash can of course be important. There are lots of these, I'm just gonna illustrate a couple, one of which is dynamically important, and that is that these insoluble silicate particles can act as nucleation sites for hydrous phase change. So they can form water droplets, hail, uh, and this can have uh, pretty strong consequences for the dynamics. Of course, you're creating different sized particles then uh, dynamically as we absorb water onto the surface. Um, Various uh, high, uh, microphysical models have been, been incorporated into volcanic plume calculations. This is, this is a calculation from Atham. And in this particular case, having uh, water condensing and ice forming uh, allows the plumes to actually go higher. It's a little bit hard to see here, but the one with microphysics is the higher plume height uh, versus <clears throat> the, excuse me, the lower plume height uh, with no microphysics. So in this case, the microphysics matters in a macroscopic way to the dynamics of the plume. 
In other cases, microphysics might not matter for the, the plume dynamics, but might give us some insight into what's going on in the plume. And this is probably the case uh, with electrical charging. So volcanic ash can become electrically charged. It's insulating, so it holds on to its charge for quite some time once it is charged. This can happen through lots of different processes. You can happen when you break up particles, which is called fracto charging. Tribal charging is particles colliding with each other. And then finally, you can have particles charging because they have um, different dielectric effects as you start to get ice and grapple, uh, like a dirty thunderstorm. And so all these can be operated in a, operating in a volcanic plume, creating different signals. Of course, we can see from a distance volcanic lightning, so it becomes a nice way of determining heights of plumes from a distance in places that are very remote. Um, and as I'll show in a second, you might also be able to use some of these information to get at some of the compressible fluid dynamics. So one of the interesting things is the ability um, to hold charge on particles is really related to the background atmospheric pressure. And it's illustrated in these two figures on the left. Here uh, we have this, let's say this plot, this is pressure in the bottom versus height. And this is showing a case where we're overpressurized. We're gonna form a shock. This is the pressure evolution above the vent. So we actually go below pressure uh, compared to the atmosphere. And then we have the shock and then return to atmospheric pressure. K here just refers to the overpressure ratio. So in this case, we're 10 times the pressure of the atmosphere. And this one, two, three, and four illustrates where you are in this diagram below here. So this is showing pressure, but in this case, maximum charge density. This is described what's as called the passions curve. So we start off undersaturated, we saturate, so we start discharging. Uh, and this happens until well, we're under pressurizing. And then once we get the shock, we quench this discharge and then other processes can occur in the plume. And this may be one way to create this sort of continuous radio frequency signal that we see in a lot of volcanic plumes. And that's illustrated here. These are uh, discharge events from experiments conducted in Germany. And then also um, looking at the, where this maps into the shock relationship. So you basically can map out the shock based upon these discharges. Again, this doesn't really change the particle dynamics in a large way because electric fields aren't strong compared to the charge in particles but it certainly gives you a way of understanding what's going on remotely, which is one of the things we're interested in. So just to wrap this up, I'll just map out those different effects in, in a set of equations here. This is a, a scaled set of equations, um, fluid equations. Uh, so before we were looking at the horizontally average, these aren't at horizontally averaged. And I just want to illustrate where those different effects map into these uh, equations. This is conservation of continuity, um, uh, mass, momentum, thermal energy. And the compressibility effects, of course, map into this Mach number term. Uh, and so that would relate to both choke conditions and, and the shock relationships we saw before. Um, near vent entrainment is primarily controlled by this uh, stress tensor, one of Reynolds number. This is also where you would incorporate things like uh, turbulence models, like LES and that sort of thing. Uh, sorting is determined a lot like we saw by that Lagrangian equation by the Stokes and the Froude number. So Stokes is describing the unsteady dynamics associated with drag between two particle and fluid, for example, and the Froude's is, Froude number is describing the steady uh, forcing due to gravity. And then finally, if we have microphysical interactions like we were seeing before where we have phase change um, and latent heat release, we would have terms that would relate how one phase is changing into another. So example, um, water vapor going into a liquid water phase. Now, while we can map these out and sort of form this, this sort of relationship here, actually solving these becomes, of course, complicated. And there are pieces of physics that we don't always have in these terms. So I'll just leave this uh, here. And so um, what I basically described is how classical ther uh, plume theory has helped us understand a lot of the dynamics of this system. But certainly, a lot of the inherent assumptions here um, uh, do limit some of our ability to make some predictions. And then I laid out a set of questions that we can maybe discuss later, but um, how do source conduit processes modify plume structure through time? How do compressibility effects modify entrainment? How can we detect these? How can we constrain entrainment, eruption, scale flows? And how do we comprehensively incorporate these in models? How can we characterize particle size, concentration, heterogeneity in eruptions? And how do small scale processes influence flow? And, uh, and then I think at the end here, this is something that I think Antonio will address, which is how do we validate and, and benchmark these sort of models. So I think of that, I will end my presentation, Helga, and we can take questions. Great, well, thank you very much, Joe. Uh, just as a reminder for those of you who may have joined late, uh, to answer, to ask questions at the bottom of 
your Zoom window, there's this Q and A uh, uh, icon. If you click on it, a window will pop up and you can either type or paste a question in there. And then we will try to go through as many of those as possible. And anybody who has asked a, questions, a question, once we try to answer it, uh, you will be unmuted to give you a chance to interact uh, with the speaker. Um, so at this point, I don't see any questions. Um, while you're all thinking, um, <clears throat> let's thank Joe um, uh, once again, and perhaps uh, some of the uh, other speakers uh, slash panelists. Uh, oh, here's a question. Okay, let's. Um, <clears throat> This question is by Leif Karlstrom. Uh, is it clear whether dynamics in the atmosphere are, sp are a stronger control on plume dynamics than say crater shape? I don't see that addressed here. Certainly I'd say in some cases, and other people can jump in, but certainly in some cases bent over plumes do uh, influence entrainment quite a lot. And that's been shown uh, by several of the other conveners in this uh, session uh, through a set of papers. Now it's certainly, Crater shape can influence entrainment. That's been addressed in a few papers, but certainly hasn't been explored as much as the wind problem. I'd say they both are important. Whether one is more important than another depends probably on this certain eruptive episode. Leif, uh, did that address your question? Okay. Uh, the next question is by James Kubicki. James, uh, uh, you are actually unmuted on our end. If you hit the unmute on your side, you can actually ask the question unless you prefer me to read it for you. Uh, no, sorry, I had to get my mic and camera in the morning at all. Uh, so it seemed to me two things that were important for the dynamics were the, the charges. And so I'm wondering, you know, what has been done? Has there been a lot done in the geochemistry of that to, on, on the particle level? And the other thing I was wondering about, has, have people tried to determine the thermodynamics of these ash gas uh, reactions? I was wondering if, you know, if, if there was endothermic, exothermic, how that might affect the, the plume itself. Right, so th there are several groups working on the charging problem uh, from several different perspectives. Um, uh, ash has been measured in the field using uh, essentially little Faraday cups to People know what kind of charge ash has as it rains down on the, on the surface. Um, there have been experiments conducted in my group and in Germany and um, and and in Japan, uh, measuring charges on on particles. These experiments are, are kind of controlled atmosphere experiments. We have fluidized beds, we have lots of collisions, and then you measure how the charge um, builds up. It doesn't seem to be strongly controlled by the um, silicate composition, so. Basaltic ash charges relatively similar to rhyolitic ash, um, but but there's maybe a subtle effect there. Um, in terms of so there's a, I think a you know growing body of work on this um, both from the volcanic ash glass perspective, uh, but also from the physics community thinking about um, charging processes. There are lots of curiosities that are still not completely um, well described. One of which is tribal charging. So in tribal charging, uh, particles collide with each other and they become charged. Um, and with volcanic ash, you can get a net charge on, say, small particles relative to big particles just because you have different sizes and you have different uh, surface areas. And, and so that's something that, you know, hasn't been fully explored and certainly could be more, more could be done on that in the volcanic context. Um, in terms of uh, other reactions, there, there is actually quite a bit of, love, a bit of work thinking about, um, about uh, chemistry going on at the volcanic ash water interface. Um, and um, and some incorporation of this into models in terms of say latent heat. And so that Athen result actually is a latent heat result where you're, you're producing these hydrous phases, hydrometeors, and it's actually causing the plume to rise a little bit more. So it's a broad Thank scale you. answer, but yeah, there, there are some working in. I can certainly send you more information if you're interested. All right, thanks. Okay, the next question is by Einat Leff. Einat. Uh, Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, yeah, I was thinking, um, thanks Joe, that was really interesting. And I'm trying to see um, if there is something that we can as a community prepare 
um, to be ready for the next plume eruption to collect specific types of data and observations that you think would be most useful for making the models better and pushing them forward? Um, is there something that when you build your model, you say, oh, I wish I, I knew that property or I wish I had observation of this process? Yeah, I'll get, I'll get the short answer here and I, I'm guessing we'll return to this in our discussion as well. But maybe mm -hmm. one thing that um, be interested, of course, a lot of the things we do measure are very useful. Total grain size distribution is very important. You know, having an idea of what at the, what's going on at the event in terms of grain sizes is, is extremely important. It would be useful, and oftentimes we don't know it, is to know a bit better about the overpressure is at the vent. So getting an idea of that, I think mm -hmm. it would be important. Um, I, I think more could be done with the microphysical aspect. So basically, these aren't things that you'd measure necessarily in an active column, but maybe in a set of experiments, things that go into uh -huh. these models, but uh, Mm -hmm. that, that haven't been explored fully for all the atmospheric, you know, constituents. Right. That's, a, that's a short answer. I think we'll, there's a longer answer there too. I think we can maybe chat about in the discussion. Cool. Yeah, thank you, Arnat. Uh, next question is by Tomaj Chiacetti, who looks like he's trying to hide from the atmosphere in Oregon. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so um, what happened to the pyroclasts, like several millimeters or centimeters during the shock wave, and especially to the like 70, 80% of gas they contain, does it have an impact on the class themselves? Yeah, well, it might. Um, uh, something that, you know, uh, we've talked about uh, a little bit is, is that particles could break up or could, could also agglutinate. Um, so there's a greater chance of interaction when you have higher concentrations. Um, from the electrical charge perspective, um, it's important because there might be lots of collisions and that can charge the material. Um, and from an aggregation perspective, if you can form especially a thin film of water around these particles fast enough, having collisions is going to influence whether they aggregate into the creature lapilli, for example. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, thank you, Toma. Uh, the next question is uh, by Carlos, Lavert. Um, Carlos, uh, if you unmute yourself, uh, you, you can ask it directly to Joe. Okay. Well, why don't I read it? Um, uh, great presentation. Thanks. A question. Is it possible uh, to involve particle ag aggregation into the particle sorting scaled Lagrangian equation? Uh, yes, I think I think so. There are a couple ways you can do this. Um, one is to have a population, basically model a, a population distribution, so you know particle size distribution, and have that shift based upon some um, measured or assumed aggregation efficiency. Um, you can also do this with uh, uh, fluid equations, um, where you can back out using kinetic theory and other assumptions the collision rates, and then from that determine a sort of rate law for aggregation. So you can certainly do things like this. Of course, um, one of the challenges is that we can't, in any of these models, resolve things really down to particle scale. And, and so there's gonna be always some um, subgrid modeling that you need to do there. Okay. Um, so uh, I think we can uh, address one more question and after that we need to go on uh, to Antonio's talk. Um, Joe, would you be receptive to people sending you emails with questions? That would be fantastic. Yeah, have... absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So the uh, last question we'll be able to, to address uh, relating to Joe's talk is uh, by Benerji. Um, Benerji, if you unmute yourself, you can ask it yourself. Uh, if not, I will go ahead and read it. Okay, I'll go ahead and read it. Uh, to solve analytically the model system of equations, what are the parameters and constants? So, so in detail, I'll refer you to that Morton Taylor Turner paper, but um, for that particular paper, um, the important thing there was is, um, looking at uh, whether the source was a point source or some other complicated source, but a point source, you need to know, uh, assume background stratification of the fluid, um, and, um, and you need to set the entrainment coefficient. Um, that set of equations does uh, allow for an analytical solution. When you start to incorporate other effects like, um, like um, the Woods paper did, you need to start to solve these things numerically. 
Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Joel. Uh, it was a great talk. And um, I will uh, give over to Kyle Anderson, um, who will continue on. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Antonio Costa, who will be our next uh, speaker. Antonio is director currently of INGV Bologna. Antonio has really worked on everything from physical properties of magma to volcanic risk assessment, but uh, most relevant to today, he's worked extensively in volcanic plume dynamics and ash transport. And he coordinated the International Eruption Column Model Intercomparison Study. Uh, so today, Antonio will be talking about an overview of various approaches of volcanic plume modeling. Antonio? Hello, thank you very much. I uh, hope you can hear me uh, well. Thank you, Kylie. Thank you, all the organizers of this uh, very interesting uh, initiative. And this, um, to give, uh, just in this, um, during this initiative, I will give an overview of the various approach of volcanic plume models. And uh, this is basically based on uh, uh, two years long efforts, uh, efforts that the international community did um, in during this um, eruptive column model intercomparison study. And here it's, uh, you can see the list of all the participants. There are about 25 people from different groups up to more than 10 institutes, different uh, um, Antonio, More than, uh, yeah. Antonio, can you, uh, sorry, can you show your screen? Is, uh, okay, yeah. Can you see now? No, not yet. No? Uh, just a minute, share. Can you see now? Yes. Oh, yes, perfect. good. Sorry for that. Now, I was saying uh, uh, most of, uh, of uh, the talk today is uh, basically based on this um, intercomparison model, column model intercomparison study. We carried out uh, together with uh, the colleagues that are, uh, are listed um, as author of this paper that is uh, the summary of, uh, of the study. And uh, I, I will explain which are uh, mainly the motivation. Beside the fantastic introduction, introduction that Joe gave to my talk, and we have seen that there are uh, a lot of uh, open questions, scientifically very relevant, but the study of uh, eruption column, of uh, plume models, volcanic plume models, has uh, also a relevance. Uh, it's uh, strongly relevant for uh, the initialization of volcanic ash transport dispersal model, uh, models. So any, any of the volcanic ash uh, transport model need to some eruption source parameters. At least we need to know the column height. The column height is uh, relatively easy to observe or uh, to reconstruct in some way. The mass distribution inside the column the mass eruption rate, the, flu the flux of mass uh, from the column, and the total grassland distribution that can tell us how this uh, uh, mass flow rate is uh, subdivided um, among the different, the different particle classes. Th this is the classical approach for, um, for uh, uh, volcanic uh, transport, uh, ash uh, transport model, but mm -hmm. And uh, this is, for example, an example, uh, this is an example from Etna. It's a study I did with my former st student. It is just to show that this model need in some way with the available observation to be initialized in terms uh, of a SUS term. That means we need to characterize and describe the eruption column in, in the property of this eruption column. And what we need to describe is uh, the column height, as I said, the mass distribution. And uh, to do this, we need uh, some model. But uh, let's see which, which are the approach, the current approach in the, in the scientific community. 
it's we have uh, uh, a hierarchy of a mod of uh, models of uh, approaches one is uh, the basic one is the empirical models is represented by the empirical models that we call here to distinguish from the other zero d model zero dimensional models what are this model basically are empirical or semi empirical correlation between the flux of mass the mass flow rate and the column height because this is based basically on some theoretical results obtained with the buoyant plume model that uh, Joe just introduced. And this uh, category of model tell us that the dependency between the mass flow rate and the total height, the two column height, is roughly a power four. And this is, was better calibrated empirically recently by Larry Mastin et al. Mastin two, uh, 2000, et al. 2009. And the recent efforts, for example, the model that was introduced before by the Guterres Bonadon, the model by Caracci that I will introduce later, are all uh, trying to refine, to make this model a bit more realistic, for example, including the effects of wind that in the case of uh, strong wind. Here we have the wind and here the, um, the, the, the intensity basically. And you see when we have a weak plume with strong wind, the wind is strongly affected because it's bent over by the wind, but not only, uh, as I will explain a while, the wind is able also to change the structure of turbulence and so the enchainment mechanism. And uh, as you can see, this, the important message from this slide is that this kind of a relationship between column height and the uh, uh, mass flow rate, that in this case is in logarithm scale, that means uh, there is an order of magnitude from one point to another. In this case, uh, the, the description of the observation is quite scattered, means that there is large vari variability, large uncertainty. And as we will see, this is as a consequence on the determination of the mass flow rate. And another category of another, in this hierarchy of a model, the, the next one is the buoyant plume models that uh, were introduced in the 1956 by Morton et al. and that um, Joe uh, already described and uh, facilitate my work. In this case, this, uh, this model are based on uh, control volume equations like uh, um, cylindrical control volume and is mass balance, uh, momentum balance and, uh, uh, across this, um, this uh, control volume. This uh, category of model is strongly used, it is uh, very popular and there are probably several tens of uh, version of this uh, formulation in, in the international community but roughly are all based on the similar assumption. That is what we did in the intercomparison study. We tried to, um, to analyze and um, quantify the difference due to the different assumptions. Are very useful because uh, are computationally are very, very cheap, can be run very fast, uh, in a faster way. And, uh, for, for this reason, are, um, are popular for operational uh, purposes. And, uh, but obviously, they have some limitation in the sense that since are based on a set of uh, hypotheses, of assumptions, like uh, uh, Joe listed before, they are not general. They cannot be generalized to any case or any kind of, um, of, uh, of uh, eruption plume. The next one, the, the third uh, category of this uh, of a model, of this type of eruption column models, are the computational fluid dynamics models. There exist, uh, in this case, also several uh, uh, formulations. They are similar, but we studied also in this study with the difference between uh, the, the existing approaches, or, or at least the few that we had in the study. In this case, the equation uh, mass, uh, momentum, energy, conservation equation are solved uh, numerically with uh, using a, a very powerful uh, computer cluster if we want to have, uh, have uh, results 
in reasonable time because these are highly computational, they have highly high computational cost as Joe already introduced because it, it, we would need to solve all the scale that are involved in the problem and it's from a practical point of view uh, almost impossible. So this kind of a category of model is extremely valuable for basic research but so far not really cannot re be really used for operational purposes. Uh, and one thing that um, I want to highlight and um, maybe some point for the final for the general discussion we will have uh, at the end of this uh, two days um, initiative a workshop uh, is uh, basically the, the uh, uh, not only the, the fact that the, um, this uh, kind of model are very demanding from a computational point of view but also or today we we have a new generation of machine and what we need to ask is if the community is ready to use the computational power that is available today and um, as um, I will try to explain, probably we, we are taught and uh, in, uh, in Europe we are currently uh, developing a project called Cheese, called Cheese, where we are trying to adapt, to rewrite the computational codes in order to use the modern generation architecture, because obviously to use a petascale, exascale machine, you need to, to have uh, a, a, an appropriate uh, uh, code written in a appropriate way. Anyway, these are uh, the list of the models we used in the, in the studies. As you see, we have up to 17 models of the different uh, categories that I just introduced. We had four zero D models, the mass natal that does an account for the effect of the wind, the Gruter Bonadon in 2012 and the Woodhouse et al. 2013, Carazzo et al. 2014, that all three have uh, in some way tried to account for the effects of the wind on the entrainment coefficient and on the bending of the, of the plume. We had uh, up to nine um, one-dimensional model, point plumb model, and uh, that are listed here and here it's the corresponding order. As you see, the point plumb model, each one uh, make a different assumption on the entrainment, and this can suggest to you that uh, probably there is some issue in determining uh, the entrainment coefficient just because uh, it doesn't exist. In the sense that there is, uh, depending on the regime, this, um, this uh, variable can uh, have uh, slightly different uh, values and also in the experiment. Uh, one experiment can give one value, another can give another. I took they are very close from 0 0.15 to 0 0.09. Since the problem is strongly nonlinear, a variation of a few percent of the entrainment coefficient, as I will show, can have a drastic effect, dramatic effects on the results on the column height. Then uh, the three-dimensional model make different approach, have a different approach to describe the turbulence. Most of them have uh, the classical larger simulation and the one as the implicit less uh, larger simulation that uh, make it closer to the, the direct numerical simulation. With all these 17 models, we solved the same problems. We set two kinds of problems, two case studies. One in which we fixed, assigned the mass discharge rate, the mass eruption rate, and look at what is the answer of each model in terms of column height and the column dynamics. In the second exercise, we fixed the column height and uh, ask it to the model to determine which, kind, which mass discharge rate is needed by the model to reproduce such height. In two condition, we consider the windless condition and windy condition. One strong wind for the weak plume in order to have the worst case and another uh, relatively low wind for a strong plume. 
Uh, here on the on the bottom, on the left, on the side is the wind profile used for this kind of exercise in the case of weak and strong plume. Here are some uh, representative results in terms of uh, of what. Uh, this is an uh, important uh, point uh, to discuss. When we have a three-dimensional uh, results from a three-dimensional model, a computational fluid dynamics model, we have uh, several uh, problems when we try to compare with a simple one. Uh, because uh, obviously the buoyant plume model are steady, whereas uh, uh, CFD model are, uh, are not. Uh, sorry, is someone calling? Uh, I miss them. I don't know. If, uh, I heard some um, some noise in the background. I don't know if it's someone uh, trying to write me. Okay, no, I can go on. Uh, I was saying it's uh, very important to 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 to, to choose a filter that allow us to, to compare the results of the three-dimensional unsteady uh, model with those of the buoyant plume uh, theory models. And as you can see from um, this uh, slide, that just to show some example, we have uh, quite uh, already quite interesting results. Here I report the temperature profile in, with the continuous line uh, the, the temperature profile given by the buoyant plume model, buoyant plume, uh, plume theory model, and uh, with the dots, the, 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 the dots given by the CFD models, by the 3D models. On the left for weak plume, on the right for strong plume. And you can already see, uh, this is, uh, we will um, uh, go deeper uh, future in the next slides, that the, in the case of a weak plume, both buoyant plume BPT models and 3D models collapse and give very similar profiles. In the other case on the right, when we have a strong plume, the true family of models diverge in terms of a solution. We have the, the BPT model that give an, as profile, give this, this uh, family, this is continuous line uh, uh, reported here, and the uh, 3D model instead give this answer with this uh, the dotted one, and you can see that they don't don't uh, don't overlap. Uh, then when once that we were able to, to we we choose we were able to choose a filter that was uh, along with us to compare uh, to to average the 3D results with 1D1, we were able to compare all the model together. And here we can see the results of uh, we got when we assigned the mass flow rate, asked to the model to, to estimate the column height needed for that mass eruption, for that mass eruption rate. In this case, it's, it's relatively easy. We fix the, the mass eruption rate, we, we look uh, which, uh, which is uh, the value of the column height reproduced by the model. For the, all the other parameters that were fixed and were in common among uh, all the models. Even if all the parameters were uh, in common, were uh, the same, you see that there is quite, uh, quite a relatively large uh, variability in terms of a column. Here it's reproduced the average of all the models and here is the results of the individual 1D models, here the results of the individual 3D models, and here that of the empirical models. Here for the weak plume with no wind, here with the weak plume with wind, in windy, in windy condition. And you can see already that in one case, the standard deviation among the models is around 20%. In this case, it's around 30 In the case of of a strong uh, plume case, we have uh, the model suggests uh, less variability of the order of uh, the standard deviation is of the order of 70% in a case, 8% in the other. This is um, not bad results, even because, as I will explain uh, in the next slides, uh, column themselves um, don't have a single value. 
column of fluctuate. So, and the fluctuation probably are, are the order of uh, 10%. So the difference between the model is the same of the difference due to the variab nature of variability of the phenomenon. But when this, because the approach that we used, if you remember my former slide, what we do is, uh, is take the column height, try from the column height to estimate mass eruption rate. But you need to remember this mass eruption rate as a dependency, this a power four. So this will reflect the much, much larger uh, uncertainty in terms of mass flow rate. This is the other exercise, the other study we did, uh, where we, we, we try to find which is the mass flow rate for an assigned column height. Means we fix the column height, we solve an inverse problem to find the appropriate mass flow rate. In this case, we have a, a variability around 60% for the weak plume with no wind. Uh, obviously, in this case, we couldn't use uh, the 3D model, whereas in the previous slide, we had the 3D category. Why? Because to solve an inverse problem is comp computational very demanding. So we were not able to solve this problem using a... Um, uh, uh, CFD models, the computational, uh, the, the, the dimensional ones. Uh, uh, also for the issue that I was discussing before, because probably we are also not in a condition that the code today allowed to exploit the maximum, the, the available uh, power or computational power that is available today. In any case, I, the, I was saying that the standard deviation is quite large, it's around 60% in the case of a weak plume with no wind, and about 90-95% for a weak plume with wind. It's slightly uh, smaller in the case of a strong plume with no wind, and about 50% uh, also for the strong plume with wind. And um, this uh, it's, uh, seems quite uh, large uncertainty, but with this current approach, uh, uh, cannot do much, uh, we cannot do much better. Uh, here I go back to the profiles. Before I show, I show what do you a profile of a temperature for uh, the, 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 one, the, the, the different one given um, by the two categories of model, BPT and uh, CFD. In this case, I show the entrainment, the entrainment fraction and the velocity. I, again, here, for the weak plume case, you can see that uh, both the profile given directly by the 1D models and the averaged profile extracted by the 3D uh, simulation are more or less overlap each other, apart um, one, uh, a, few uh, a, a, a few cases. But in, even in, in case of uh, windy condition, all the models are in the, same, uh, in the same range. So it means that uh, for the weak plumes, we have uh, 1D HD model, they are very consistent and give very similar results. So what does it mean? probably means that the hypothesis, the assumption that uh, Joe uh, listed before for the formulation needed for the formulation of the BPT model are valid. And uh, as it should, it should be, we, the, 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 um, the average of the 3D give the, the, the same results of the 1D. In the case of strong plume, um, we have a very different results, and here report the same variables, the entrained air fraction and the velocity profiles for the case without, in the windless windy condition. In both cases, there are quite uh, strong deviation between the, the 3D results and the 1D results. And it, this is very evident, very, in the case here of the velocity profile, for example. Uh, because uh, BPT model tended to overestimate the temperature, over overestimate also the velocity. Velocity profile given by 1D models is, uh, can be drastically larger than that uh, predicted by the 3D one. 
But uh, even uh, there is difference, you can see here, BPT model, the one, uh, for example, based on the results on the model, by, on the um, uh, formulation by Woods that was introduced by Joe before, uh, predict the uh, velocity of the order for strong plume of the order of 200, 250 meters per second, uh, around the points level, uh, before, sorry, in the convective region. Instead, the 3D model gave uh, about 100 meters per second or less. Uh, another uh, another things that we did uh, following the study I, I did with my uh, code one here it's uh, it's in the same special issue uh, because I forgot but I will tell you in a while uh, that this um, the study is uh, is an, um, published in a special issue of GVGR. another paper that is uh, in the same issue it is uh, here but to get all show that uh, if we have, uh, for this range of mass flow rate, if we plot the, the different column height, because we, we get a characteristic height that is uh, the neutral points level, another characteristic height that is the maximum spreading level, the height of the maximum spreading level, and another that is the total column height. If we consider this different height and try to reproduce, these are, uh, uh, with dots, dots with bar, and we try to reproduce with the BPT model, that is the line, we see that we need to calibrate each time, case by case, an optimal effective value of the entrainment coefficient. This probably means that uh, to generalize the um, to large flow rate, the um, assumption of a constant entrainment coefficient is, uh, is uh, not correct. And um, in this case, for example, uh, we see this is uh, that there are bar on the line in, in both cases. It is, uh, the bar represents what? Represents the fact that the column height, the plume height is not uniform. I mean, I mean a, a change from a, a change spatially, slightly change spatially. Moreover, change with time, because as I said, column height is not a constant, it's a column height fluctuate, fluctuate, all the column heights, all the characteristic column heights. And this fluctuation can be of the order 10 or even 20% that is similar to the difference between the different answers given by the different models. And here you can see that is an example of the intercomparison of the 3D models in the same special issue. And you see that one important uh, feature that uh, must be accounted, must, miss, uh, uh, must be fixed, is uh, the filter, where we filter at, at which concentration we assume that the column height is the top of the column height, where the column, because the column in nature doesn't, uh, doesn't have an abrupt uh, end. This depends uh, 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 at which concentration we decide that the column um, is uh, completely resolved. And here there are results for different uh, uh, fractions. And you can see that uh, when we have a very small fraction, we, the, 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 the height collapse in the same, whereas for course one, we have a large fluctuation. In the in the this um, second uh, study that they, that I mentioned just uh, in the previous uh, slide, it, where we compared the, all the av available um, uh, uh, three-dimensional model that uh, were considered in the, in the study, the simulation had showed that general agreement. I took, uh, obviously, among them, there was, uh, th there was some difference. And uh, in particular, specific uh, studies uh, between uh, the strong and the weak uh, plume cases revealed that the strong plume have a different entrainment process with respect to the weak plumes. It identified the most relevant uh, process. Obviously, I cannot go uh, in deep to this uh, point, but um, uh, I will invite later to, to have a look to the results in the special issue. So to sum up, sum up uh, so far, 
we can say that for an assigned mass flow rate, the column height simulated by each model seem to have a relatively good agreement with each other. Let's say the order 10, 50% uh, spreading. And because, but because the strong, uh, of the strong dependence of a mass flow rate uh, with height, for an assigned column height, the, the mass flow rate is um, depend on which model is applied and we can have a difference from 50 to 90 percent and this difference is higher for weak plume and in presence, in presence of intense wind uh, but uh, on the opposite this is for the determination of the mass flow rate but remember that for the case of the determination of the profile and the dynamics of what occur inside inside the the, the column we had the opposite results because we saw that the buoyant plume theory is very well uh, uh, justified for weak plume, while the hypothesis that Joe in, uh, showed us introduced before are not valid in the case of strong plume. Profile of 1D model for strong plume, in fact, different uh, from the cross section integral of the three models, whereas are, are, are similar for the weak plume. This can be due to different entrainment processes, gravity current effects, recycling and role of large jetties. Moreover, another result of this uh, international study was that uh, uh, the, 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 the parametric study on the entrainment showed that, that this quantity, the entrainment coefficient, I, I have. Uh, Entrainment coefficients, because uh, uh, I forgot to mention that uh, some model have one, uh, the classical entrainment coefficient, they are crosswind entrainment coefficient. Uh, uh, both have a fifth order control on, determination, on the determination of the column height and so uh, of the mass flow rate. On the basis of the three dimensional, uh, three D simulation results, it's required to develop new approaches to describe entrainment in uh, 1D models. And the results highlight that uh, obviously this is uh, a simplification for uh, operational application of this model. We need to pay attention to the uncertainty of the model themselves. This will be very well covered by Costanza and Larry uh, on, uh, in a few days. And, um, I put, I put it here just to stimulate the discussion. For uh, any future information in detail of what I've presented, uh, summarized so far, uh, I invite um, the people who are interested to have a look to this special issue of a Journal of Geovolcanology and Geothermal Research that you can find on this link. Uh, thanks uh, for the attention and uh, leave here um, the main question that I would like to, to be discussed with you. Great, uh, thank you, Antonio. Um, so I'll give Antonio a virtual round of applause for an excellent talk. Um, I think at this point we'll have a 10 minute Q&A following the, uh, the approach earlier for Joe's talk. Um, as a reminder, please uh, go ahead and type your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, or if you don't want to type your full question in, just enter your name and we can unmute you, um, and you can then go ahead and ask your question yourself. So again, use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen to ask questions. Thanks. And I'll go ahead and open up, uh, before we start getting questions pouring in, open up questions to other panelists and moderators as well. Okay, our first question is from uh, Robert, uh, wow, sorry, I apologize, I'm going to mangle your last name, uh, Robert Constantinescu. Uh, great talk, thank you. Um, actually, Robert, you may be unmuted now, um, if you want to go ahead and try to answer. If you have a Hello, I was wondering where my button okay. is, microphone. Uh, yes, we can hear you, please go ahead. Great. So, um, I have a question about um, the maximum column height that is expected in the simulations, of course, given the different altitudes for the vent and the differences in the atmosphere properties. Like say, if we simulate a vent at sea level and you expect a maximum column height of 40 kilometers given an MER, uh, will it be the same for a 5,000 meter altitude volcano source? Sorry, um, will it be like no, a 45 no. kilometers in this case, Colin? 
Uh, thanks for the question. No, there will be a difference, obviously, because uh, in, in the study, we fixed uh, this exactly the same condition in the weak and the stronger bloom cases uh, for all uh, the models. But uh, in, ter in general terms, the difference, uh, the, the, there would be some difference due to the difference of pressure, for example, uh, a density of the atmosphere, because uh, most what control the dynamics uh, of the bloom it's also uh, the, the, it's also con it's, uh, also due to the, the the density variation of the atmosphere. As you know, the density is uh, higher at the sea level and uh, much lower on the up level. And moreover, it's uh, it's stratificated, and uh, this determines also where the buoyancy neutral buoyancy level is. The neutral buoyancy level is where the average density of the column uh, uh, at that level and that of the surrounding atmosphere is the same. Obviously, this condition can change if you start from uh, uh, sea level or 5,000 meters, as you said, above sea level. For especially, for especially for weak plumes, obviously, because uh, weak plume can be a few kilometers. These effects can be more relevant than... Uh, but it's not a first order uh, effect with respect to the one I just uh, presented. So for the very high eruption column quoted in some literature, like over 40 kilometers, let's say, it's all a function of a very large mass discharge rate? Yes, yes. And, and, uh, and no, no, not only mass discharge. It's mass discharge rate and uh, plume dynamics. To have uh, a plume much higher than 40, 50 kilometers, you need, um, probably you need a Coimbrat plume, some things that is very widely spread and uh, like uh, it's, it's uh, a region of a few tens or up to hundreds of kilometers that just uh, rise up in the atmosphere. With the classical, uh, 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 but plane and columns is harder to have a column much higher than 50 kilometers. Okay, uh, so sorry, one more question. So, the higher the, the plume gets, the less uh, influence the density of the atmosphere you will have on the flow rate. Sorry, can you repeat? Yeah, so the higher the plume gets in the atmosphere. The, yeah. the density of the atmosphere will have a, a lower role into the into how far the plume gets. That's the thing. The atmosphere becomes negligible at some point, at some height. Uh, yeah, but also the density itself of the plume become uh, less. So uh, at the end, what can't, what uh, matter is the density difference. It's not the value, uh, the absolute value. Okay. Because uh, you have uh, a region where the surrounding density is um, is uh, uh, larger than the mixture. Then do you have the neutral buoyancy level, and then uh, a region where you have again uh, the, the density of the mixture that is uh, larger than the surrounding atmosphere. It, it, this is the reason for which you can form the gravity current. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have another question from Thomas Aubrey. Uh, Thomas, would you like to ask your question? Sure, thanks. Thank you, Antonio, for the nice talk. Uh, I'm just wondering to which, question, to which um, extent you think that there are really nine different 1D models uh, in this study, with some of that have important difference, like the account for TGSD, or I think one of them maybe for aggregation. But surely most of the difference comes from the uh, entrainment coefficient parameterization. Uh, and I'm just thinking about like, for future intercomparison exercise, I do think it would be more beneficial to reduce the number of models but have like an extensive um, like sensitivity study of entrainment parameterization instead. Yes, thanks, Tom, Thomas. Now, this is a good point. O obviously, w what I summarized is the first order control, but uh, there are also the, uh, what we try to do, even if the models a, a different uh, feature that someone could uh, count for particle uh, aggregation. We try to set the condition as, as, as the, the most similar as possible. And in the future, probably yes. Um, the, there are um, 
we, as we did with the three-dimensional model, even for the 1D model, it can be the object of a, of a, a more expanded uh, intercomparison. Agree? Thank you. But okay, in, any case, in, in any case, our, sec, our uh, no first order uh, difference. Uh, we, in the study, we identified the, the one that have a first order, uh, first order uh, control. Obviously, there are several other uh, effects like the one uh, that were mentioned in the last two questions that can have also a role. Okay, we have a question from Josh Crozier. Josh, you want to answer or ask your question? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering for large plumes with the 3D plume models, how large of a region around the plume do you need to simulate to have the sort of proper wind fields develop that the, the plume itself would create? Uh, at least it should be larger a few times the, the the column itself and the plume uh, itself. Uh, for example, in the case of uh, of the strong plume case, that was a case very similar to Pinatubo, we used a domain of about uh, 100 kilometers. Uh, one model, uh, because it was very demanding from a computational point of view, one model couldn't uh, use such a large domain up to 100 kilometers, used about 50, I think. And uh, the, the model was not even uh, able to cover all the evolution of the plume. Uh, the plume. Yeah, but uh, a sort of magnitude, I would say, a few times the column height itself. Okay, at this point, I don't see any more questions in the box. So given that we're actually a little behind schedule, I think we'll move on to the, the broader panel discussion and you'll have uh, more opportunities to ask Antonio questions at that time. Um, thank you again, Antonio. For, uh, oh, thank you, Kylie. Thank you all. Sure. So yeah, at this point, I think we'll open the discussion up. Um, as Helga described earlier, uh, we're gonna have a 30 minute discussion and this is gonna be with all of the panelists. Uh, the goal here is really to think about plume modeling in the context of a modeling collaboratory for subduction. Um, and to that end, we do want to include consideration of integration of the types of models that were discussed today with the deeper parts of the volcanic system. So that is the coupling between the subsurface and surface processes. Um, there's a list of potential discussion topics that was sent out earlier and is also on the website. And I'll just go ahead and read a few of the major topics to sort of kick things off. Um, number one, what are the strengths and limitations of the different modeling approaches? Uh, number two, what are the optimal collaborative strategies for integration of geophysical field and remote sensing observations with eruption plume modeling? And number three, what are the remaining challenges in modeling volcanic plumes? Uh, can the MCS, or that's the Modeling Collaboratory for Subduction, contribute to the op operational use of plume and tephra dispersion models? And then what are some of the biggest factors uh, limiting progress? Nonetheless, I want to emphasize that we don't want to really limit discussion to those topics. That's really just to get things started. Uh, this is not a list. And again, we do want to consider the, the coupling between the subsurface and uh, surface parts of the volcanic system. Um, so let's open it up now. I think rather than typing a full question or comment into the Q&A box, if you just enter your name, we'll go ahead and call on you, assuming you have audio. Uh, if you don't have audio, go ahead and feel free to type the question in. Otherwise, your name will be fine at this point. Um, Helga, do you want to add anything to that, or any other panelists for that matter, before we get started? Um, anything additional? Otherwise, uh, oh, and I should say, uh, Constanza Bonadonna and Larry Mastin will be our other two panelists. Um, they will be speaking on Thursday, so we'll have four panelists in total. And to kick it off for the panel, I mean, it seems to me that there's a big, um, you know, the, the, these, these models are fantastic. And I would say that, you know, big progress over the last 20 or 30 years maybe is um, understanding the steady state eruption. Even with dynamic models, ultimately we're talking about a plume height or a column radius or something like that. Um, but of course, eruptions change with time and always during the long-lived eruption, there's always a question about where it's going next. 
So how do we improve our understanding of how an eruption might evolve once we're observing uh, a set of eruptive conditions? How might we use these models to better understand what might happen next? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess there are a couple of strategies I can think of, and everybody can chime in there too. One, one of which is just to examine time-dependent scenarios. So certainly for the big 3D models, you're not going to do this real time or anything close to it, but you can do get scenarios. Let's say we have a waning eruption. This is what we might expect. And this also gets a bit back to Inot's question too, in a way, which is what would you like to know? And for any of these models, you want to know initial or, or even, you know, transient initial you know, boundary conditions. Um, what's the inlet flux? Um, that said so much, right? And, and so if we had an idea of that, you know, the models won't be able to, these sort of models won't tell us that flux unless they're coupled with something deeper. We'll say that. Yes, but uh, I would like to add some things. The, 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 question, the point that uh, Chuck uh, highlighted, you know, the, the fact that uh, eruption column are unsteady. Uh, or, or challenge the BPT model the way in which we use uh, now in the sense uh, if uh, we can get from a computational fluid dynamics model, 3D models, even if we fix the mass flow rate, we still have a fluctuation of the order of 10% uh, roughly. And uh, obviously this will not be reflected in unchanged of uh, mass flow rate. Uh, I took 10 20 percent we saw before can reflect in a larger variation of the mass flow rate but this is just uh, because we used the wrong approach okay just following up on that i think it's uh super important to um i think about uh, transitions and eruptions, um, especially if they're impactful eruptions. Um, uh, Susanna Jenkins and Mark Bevington have done some really interesting work showing statistically what um, eruption styles trans, uh, transform or uh, change into other eruption styles. And it would be nice uh, to see a numerical context for those kinds of transitions. So I agree with you. <laughs> okay, so uh, no, so again, uh, to reiterate what, what Kyle said, if, if you would like to engage in the discussion, ask a question, have a comment, just type your name or something in the Q&A box and we will unmute you. Um, uh, I'm, in the meantime, um, let me ask uh, a question to the panelists. So how do you think uh, plume modeling and, and integration with subsurface would benefit uh, from a modeling collaboratory or, or what should a modeling collaboratory uh, offer in order to be of benefit? Uh, oh, go ahead. Start. Oh, wait, wait. No, 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 you go ahead. Okay, no, just want to briefly to say that I think it's extremely important uh, collaborative framework. And we have no, no way to make uh, progress without uh, collaboration, uh, especially because uh, a, fully, a full characterization of uh, the parameters that I listed that we need to initialize uh, uh, VITTM, volcanic ash transport to dispersal models, uh, need uh, a multidisciplinary approach because uh, there is no way we can get uh, real-time information about this, uh, these parameters that are pivotal, crucial for, uh, for initializing models. So I think the community should make a huge efforts to, to develop, uh, to strengthen the collaboration and make uh, much more uh, multidisciplinary studies that uh, help to constrain better uh, the, 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 the parameters that we need to estimate. Yeah, I was just going to add that, uh, you know, in 
for better or worse, and I think for better, uh, our problem has historically kind of split off into several pieces, right? There's the, the magma chamber models of the conduit models. There's the, and you know, there are dynamic reasons for this as well. But certainly I think a modeling collaboratory could be useful in, in sort of making these models potentially more modular and, and able to couple them maybe a little bit easier. For example, conduit to atmosphere, um, which could try to tackle some of these transient problems, right? You could think about, like I showed one simple example where you have clustering in the conduit, creating pulsing at the vent, and that can have implications for the atmospheric um, properties. So that's one, one way. But actually I wanted to ask, bring up uh, also the cheese initiative um, that Antonio mentioned as maybe one model we should look at um, uh, with the modern collaboratory here in the US. It seems like the cheese initiative has worked very well. Yes, cheese. I can say a few things. Cheese. Uh, it's a uh, it's a general uh, uh, project in earth science. It's com uh, it's exascale uh, computation in uh, in a solid earth. They general. So there are code that are used for simulating the shaking of the ground in terms of earthquakes. There are codes that are used to simulate uh, the um, the plume dynamics, like Hashi. There are codes that are uh, used to simulate the transport of ash, like for d Basically, what we did is individuate some flagship. Uh, it's a European project. Uh, some flagship code. And this code is the efforts of the project is to bring this code uh, suitable for the next generation machine. Means what we realized, at least in Europe, but I think it's uh, everywhere this issue is that as community, we are especially volcanology. Obviously, if we talk meteorology, code is developed by meteorologists are very advanced in terms um, of a computationally, computational feature and can use machine scale up to petascale machine. In the case of uh, volcanology, we realize that the most of the code, the code were quite artisanal, like the one we developed. Today, we cannot do the work like I did or we did 20 years ago in the sense that we did, did the formulation, did the, wrote the code, wrote the parallel version. Today, to exploit this kind of powerful machine, you need to write the code in a given way and doesn't it's not enough just to make it parallel. You need to write a parallel code in a given way. So to do this, we establish this uh, collaboration with uh, computer scientists. In fact, in the, in the project, there are a geophysicist, a volcanologist also, and a computer scientist that <coughs> help us to improve uh, the, 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 the coding. Uh, I guess uh, this is Leif Karlström. I was going to follow up on that question from Helga and, and Antonio. I think you sort of partially answered it, but I guess one of the things that we'd like to know is, you know, should a modeling collaboratory involve like infrastructure? Should it involve software engineering? Should it involve science, right? Uh, because ultimately, I guess you have to propose to do something. <laughs> um, so I, it seems like the plume modeling component of the volcanic systems is in some sense pretty well set up for this, as opposed to the subsurface component where people don't even agree on the equations to solve. Uh, so I, I was wondering whether you, you know, the panel might comment on that, like what's the best framework if you're going to invest in a collaboratory? Uh, I can comment if anyone uh, doesn't. Yes, you are completely right. I mean, uh, I realized that when we finished the, the study a few years ago, uh, on the, the intercomparison study, <coughs> how, how behind we are uh, as community for, uh, for a, a conduit modeling in, con in the terms of conduit model. There was uh, some efforts was done um, several years ago, maybe a decade now, by Sajan, I think Bruce, Vich and Sajan, to try to, 
to make a similar sort of uh, community community model study you know the, the, among all people who develop the model for conduits but uh, I think now time are major to to do some things better and more uh, a bit more organized the similar to what we did for the, the uh, plume models but for this is uh, for the, the second question, the second point you highlighted. For the first one, that you, we need to interact with the engineering, uh, computer scientists, uh, obviously, yes. I mean, uh, if we want to, to be able to be at the same uh, pace with the, with the technology, we have no other choice. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. I think uh, it, it makes so much sense. If we look at the atmospheric community as one other example, right, of, uh, of groups, and they, they certainly have a broader infrastructure than we have, but that's certainly something that they have taken advantage of maybe more fully than we have in terms of computer scientists. So I think it'd be great if we could use this as a way to facilitate that interaction. Um, another thing that I think is useful that we haven't touched upon completely is how to integrate all the observations. And I think that's another way scientifically, we can close the loop a little bit. For example, um, it can be a challenge to compare um, numerical results to observations. There's like kind of a step missing, like what do you sort of, um, might call them models, uh, forward models to go from say concentration and gas temperature and velocity to something you might measure from radar, for example, or IR. And so that, that sort of thing would be useful too. And, and one way that I think that could be organized around this is, um, is a set of experiments. I know in the PDC community, there's been a benchmarking exercise where you have large scale experiments and then models try to replicate that. And then you have to kind of grapple with all these things. Well, we're measuring this with our pressure sensors. How does that go into the, the models? How does that link into it? How sensitive are we to initial conditions? It turns out in that particular case, that PDC exercise, getting the initial conditions from the experiments was a remarkably challenging and, um, and it's informative, I think. So that's, you know, a set of problems you could construct that would be maybe useful to organize ourselves. Well, if, if I can add something to that, um, I guess we are going to discuss more on Thursday about adaptive stress parameters also, uh, also in terms of real time um, characterization of source parameters. But I think an effort should also be made to even understand um, the parameters we get from geophysical monitoring. Because I think, you know, what we are finding is that there are still some uh, uncertainties in whether, in what we're actually seeing, you know what I mean, with the, with the different sensors. So I think, you know, I totally agree that we need to combine um, source parameters uh, with models, both for like uh, validation, but also for data simulation. To, in order to kind of produce more accurate uh, modeling, in particular in real time. But at the same time, we are, I think we are also not completely ready to do that because we still don't know exactly what we are measuring. So before even going there, we need to better understand what we are measuring. And I think, you know, this is kind of like some, you know, various groups are, are uh, working on that. And I think this is important. So it, it, it goes even beyond that, you know, because we think, okay, we know everything about how we characterize those parameters and now we are ready to calculate with the models. Well, actually, no. <laughs> I mean, when, you know, when we kind of thought that this is, that actually was the way forward, we understood that, in fact, and actually that came out exactly from the multidisciplinary project when we started talking with geophysicists, you know, with people that work with radar, satellite, and then we understood that actually there are still some uncertainties. So I think it, some work still needs to be done in that field in order to, to get to an optimal situation where we understand what we're measuring and then we can actually, uh, you know, assimilate the data into the models or use those data for validation. Because if you don't understand it, then even the validation is a little bit biased. So I mean, so I think that's a absolutely fundamental point but still more work needs to be done in a collaborative way, in a multidisciplinary way to understand what we are measuring. But we can discuss also more uh, about that um, on Thursday, I guess also when um, Larry will, will talk about operational modeling.
I guess from my perspective, I would just say that, um, can everybody hear me? <laughs> yeah, so, so um, I, I think that if we're talking about putting together a modeling collaboratory, so to me, if you're looking at it, at it from an operational perspective, one big question is um, what kinds of uh, what kinds of questions do we have that can inform operational models? Operational models have to run fast enough that you can run them during an eruption. Um, so they can't possibly include all the complicated physics that a, a three-dimensional model um, or a, a model that you would run in a research setting would include. So you can explore processes like particle aggregation in a research model and use sort of a proxy or a, um, a simplified approach in an operational model that's based on the modeling that you've done uh, under research conditions. Um, but you, you really have to kind of identify what are those critical processes that you need to study in greater detail and how can you best characterize them using a simplified approach. I mean, particle aggregation is probably the most common one, but if you simply look, you try to use a, a model to forecast where deposits land, and you have a lot of fine ash in your deposit, um, the, knowing the particle settling velocity of a fine, fine ash particle isn't enough to tell you where it's going to land if you know the wind field. You also have to know whether it's aggregating, the rate at which it's aggregating, um, and properties of the atmosphere that might control that. Um, so those are the kinds of things that you really need a, a, a research model to address that you can hopefully adapt the results of to an operational setting. Okay, um, it looks like uh, Thomas had a, a, uh, a comment. Thomas, did you want to uh, say something or uh, what you wrote, uh, does it suffice? Uh, sure, I can make the comment. It's likely coming a bit late in the discussion because uh, the time it took for me to type it. Earlier we were talking about uh, how to couple different models together and bring together different modeling approach. And we've heard a lot about conduit and plume models. And I guess tomorrow we'll hear more about the dispersion model too. Uh, I just wanted to make the point that kind of the next step in modeling going to larger scale would be aerosol chemistry climate modeling. And uh, I think that's something nice to think about in terms of collaborating with uh, climate modelers. Uh, and so, for example, in Cambridge, we have a project where we look, so actually that's something we started with Costanza, but not on us. So we, uh, we look at how climate change would affect plume rise using plume model, and then how changing uh, injection height of DSO2 uh, would then affect the climatic impact of an eruption using a climate model. Uh, and there are also a lot of, not a lot, but a few modeling group in the UK and in the US who are incorporating how ash affect uh, SO2 and sulfate aerosol cycle in climate models. And I think they would be very interested in, you know, talking more and collaborating more with typically uh, three-dimensional plume modelers uh, and also when dispersion models. So uh, I guess that's a community that isn't really represented here, but uh, I think in terms of future direction, it could be pretty exciting. Yeah, I, I would just quickly like to interject uh, um, uh, that I definitely uh, echo that comment also with sort of the overall focus and thrust of um, uh, the initiative that this modeling collaboratory is, is, is part of. Um, I think the focus is, is by and large more uh, on the subsurface and I think that uh, um, it's good to bring that up and have that as a point of consideration in terms of the scope of a modeling collaboratory. Uh, but certainly uh, one question is going to be, right, where do you bound it uh, in terms of uh, the overall uh, 
effort and and again the collaboratory being part of this seduction zone for the uh, initiative but it's a good point and and one of the reasons why we started off with you know volcanic plume uh, webinars is to sort of bring that question up front uh, uh, in terms of overall scope um, before we wrap it up there's uh, one more uh, uh, question I not had a question and and uh, again uh, we can continue this conversation on Thursday um, and I you know invite everybody to uh, uh, you know join us then and and you know questions you didn't get to ask uh, points you didn't get to make uh, uh, please do so on Thursday um, can you hear me now yes great um, sorry for the overhead subway train that's going um, right nearby if you guys hear it. Sorry, city, city life. Um, so one comment I wanted to make is that some of the goals and targets that were just described in the discussion are actually already part of um, the Converse RCN mm -hmm. in terms of getting the community of modelers to decide what they need collected and what they need ready for when there is an eruption and say St. Helens goes off and what do we need? What do we collect? What's the most important data that we need collected? So it's now a really good time in terms of, uh, you know, the funding agencies to make that list and the priorities and also who is available to do operational kind of modeling, but also what kind of research models are available to combine with those operational models. Um, another comment in terms of what the collaborator can do is that there's a lot of thematic things that cut across. Um, one example is um, how do you communicate uncertainty? As the lava flow modelers, I hear the, the plume modelers, and we have the same goal of communicating our results to the public or the stakeholders in a collaboratory that deals with different types of models at different parts of the system can be really helpful in training the different kind of modelers, but maybe different students, but also providing some tools um, and guidelines and best practices um, to doing things that are really cross-cutting like that. Thank you, Anna. That, that's a very good comment. Um, um, so, um, okay, uh, Carlos, I know you have a question. Can can uh, are you okay uh, asking it on Thursday? Okay, great. Um, for the sake of time, uh, we'd like to wrap it up, especially keeping in mind that uh, Costanza and Antonio are in. Uh, very different time zone. Um, so thank you again, everybody who attended and stuck it out till the end. Uh, I know some num the numbers dropped a little bit after Antonio's talk. Um, again, a reminder, next Thursday, please join us. And thank you very much, uh, Joel and Antonio for your very nice talks and uh, Larry and Costanza uh, for being available for this panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Elke. Thank you, all of you. And it was a great time. I'm impressed that there are still about 90 people. It's a lot. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you for organizing this. It's great. Thank you. Everybody, see you Thursday. Yes. See you Thursday. Ciao. Yeah, see you Thursday. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.